Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill. Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we're going to be talking a little Bears, a little uh, Cubs and White Sox just days prior to the pitchers and catchers reporting. We're going to be talking about the Bulls r- days before the uh, the trade deadline, talking some Blackhawks. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Season is going on right now. So head on over to icehogs.com. Get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, another week. How is it going? Things are going pretty good. Cannot complain. I mean, I can not complain a little bit. I am so ready for the NFL draft to happen. Because if I see another silly mock draft on Twitter, I'm going to lose my mind. I know. I mean, it's been just endless. Oh, what if they do this? What if they do that? What if they do this? What if they do that? After a while, it's just like, man, you get sick of hearing about it. We've heard about every scenario. We've heard about trade this, do this, draft that. You know, it's like, I'm just letting the process play out right now. I know that we're most likely going to trade back. I know Ryan Poles wants to create as many draft picks as possible. We know that he has to rebuild pretty much an entire roster outside the QB and the secondary and a few other guys, but you can only simulate and speculate so much. You can only do so many fake fake trade simulations. It's just, I'm with you, man. I am right there with you. And I feel like even all of the rumors about trading Justin Fields are starting to die out because everybody's getting sick of it. So I'm kind of hoping this endless mock draft Palooza and all these different speculations just kind of get tired out too. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, I, it, you're right in the one sense. The the Justin the Justin Fields might get traded. Shenanigans are over. Um, now you're. You know, you're basically seeing them trading back, but some of these trades are just so unrealistic. Like, why in the world would the Texans trade the number two pick, their what number eighteen pick, and their next year's first round pick and second round pick to move up one spot? Why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. It does not, though. It would be pretty freaking sweet. But let's be real here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and you know, here's the thing. Some of these simulations are just way out of whack, super out of whack. And, you know, when they're like, oh, who says no to this draft? And it's like uh, the Colts give up, uh, you know, that they're all pro guard or Buckner, their defensive tackle, plus the number four pick, plus, you know, their first rounder and second rounder next year and their first rounder and second rounder this year to move up three spots. No, it's just not going to happen. The reality is, sure, you can get a lot of value, but you're going to have to trade back fairly significantly to 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 extract the most value. And, you know, the honestly, the best way to extract value is going to be partially getting somebody's next year's number one, which is going to involve you trading back, you know, at least, at least out of the top 10, most likely. And, and then a hope that that team does really bad where you get, uh, you know, like a, like an early teens pick or, you know, 10, 11, 12 pick this year. And, you get your number one pick next year. Plus if that team does bad again, 
you know, their number one pick. Look at the Eagles this year. The Eagles are drafting with a great draft pick because of the Saints. Um, the Lions drafting a great position because of the Rams. So that's what you hope for. But that's you can't plan that. You have no control over that. Uh, you know, and I mean, unless it's somebody like, oh, you traded with the Lions and then you have an opportunity to beat them twice, you know, in a season. But other than that, you really have no control over it. Um, so the reality is the Bears are going to probably trade back, but the haul is going to be far, far less than everybody is expecting. Yeah, and I think that we have to be ready to kind of temper our expectations a little bit. We could still get some nice hauls for that first overall pick, but I just think that it's being way too overblown, so to speak. And I think that there's something to be said, too, about where the Bears are going to be prioritizing where they want to draft because, you know, depending on who you trade with, like you said, there's different positions in different spots. And to me... The Bears are probably going to trade or probably draft dress best available, right? You would think that that would be kind of a philosophy. I mean, I'm not saying that they're just going to completely ignore like what they need and what they don't need. But I mean, let's say you drop down a few spots in the first round and the first position is an elite pass rusher. And if that's the best position there, you think they take that, right? Like they're not going to reach for a wide receiver and a offensive lineman right and and here's here's the reality is and i know this is just a a guide and that desperate teams will do desperate things but people are like oh the texans trading from one to two and giving up you know their one and their 18 and next year's one to move up that one spot here's the reality based on the draft value chart and again the value chart is just a guide of what the draft picks are available. You know, it takes two to tango and, and obviously there's teams that are willing to give up more to, to get their guy cough, Ryan pace cough, but the number one overall pick is worth 3000 points. The number two pick is worth 2,649 points. Would you like to know what pick number they would have to give up to the Colts would have to give up in order to equal 3000 points with their number two pick? Let's hear it. Let's see. Um, So that would be 351 points. (laughs) Pick number 186. Hmm which is like fourth, fifth rounder. And obviously you're going to extract more value from that. Right. But, right. But from a points perspective, what these is, a would you trade out of the number one spot for the number two and a fifth rounder? Probably not. No, no. Unless, unless you had a guarantee from that team that they were taking a player that you had no interest in. In that case, you're like, okay, I, I get a F basically a free fifth round pick and get, still get the guy I want. Right. Right. So if the Texans are like, yeah, definitely want to move up. Um, you know, where, where you start to see the value is dropping down to number four. That puts you at about 2,300 points. Or it's 2,297. So 800 points. That is that is like the number 76 pick. So early third rounder. Uh, you drop down to number six. That puts you at 2,092. It's like 900 points. So that's, that's, you know, a late second rounder. So it's, and again, Desperate teams will give up way more. And when you have two teams that are bidding or in Ryan Pace's case, bidding against himself, you have, you have people that will give up more than the value, but most of the time they don't give up so much value that it doesn't make sense. 
you know it's like oh give up a future future first um you know most of the time you're like okay a first rounder next year by NFL draft math, a first rounder next year is not worth as much as a first rounder this year, even if it's the same draft slot, because you have right. to wait a whole year for it to be of value. Um, and so most of the time you go, all right, I'm going to call it about a thousand points, which, uh, you know, would in that current draft will average out to about the 50th pick. So you, you say 1, 1,200 points ish is what a few a next year's draft pick is worth. So in order to trade back and get a next year's draft pick, you're looking at trading about to the number 10, the number 10 spot. And you would get that number 10 pick and next year's number one. Now, will you get a good pick at number 10? Yeah, you'll get a good football player. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you really have to go through the whole process though and be like, all right, is the guy that we really want, is he going to be available at 10? If not, how much of a drop-off do we see from going to that guy to the next guy? And there's some people saying, oh, maybe the bears trade back twice. And that's a possibility is, uh, you know, but the reality is in order to be a Super Bowl contender, you need as many uh, all pros as possible. Well, especially now, since you're so depleted because you have so little, there's so much work to be done on this roster. It's not like you're one or two players away from being a legit Super Bowl contender. So you got to make these picks count for whatever you trade back for and what you get. I really think that, you know, this is just my opinion, but I don't know if you've been seeing it, but I feel like the only useful kind of talks that people have been having about the first overall pick and who can get it from the bears. I feel like we're hearing more smoke around Carolina being a prime trade target. And that's, that's not necessarily a surprise. It's just that Carolina is going to have to trade up a bit more than say the Colts. The Colts have what the fourth pick. And I believe the Carolina Panthers I don't have it in front of me. I believe they have the ninth pick. So, but Carolina does need a quarterback. And I think with Tom Brady retiring, you also do kind of reevaluate the quarterback options out there because that does change things a little bit, but I still think you have a pretty solid idea of who would be the guys to go trade up and draft for a quarterback because the Colts were never going to get Tom Brady. Even if we speculated about it a little while back, we knew it was never really going to be a possibility. And now it's really not going to be a possibility. Carolina is a very strong possibility. I mean, those two teams right there feel like the strongest to me because I don't see Detroit trading up for a pick. I could see the Seahawks maybe doing it. Maybe. I don't think I'm as sold on them trading up as I would the Colts or the Panthers, but I could see the Seahawks doing it. I don't really see the Cardinals doing it. They still have Kyler Murray under contract for a while, unless they decide to be really bold and keep Kyler Murray and draft somebody else. But I mean, we still have an idea. It's just, I feel like with, Tom Brady retiring, it might open up the possibility of a few other teams being interested in one of those top picks. Yeah. I mean, Houston, I don't think trades up. It just, why would they waste the draft capital to move? They would really have to be like, you know what? Young's our guy. Cause I mean, he's gotta be the first pick, right? I know people have debated you know, honestly, but, it doesn't matter. They have to just fall in love with a guy. I mean, they they have to have him head and shoulders above the other guy. So whether that's right, right. CJ Stroud or or Young, and they're just like, this guy, we can't. If they have them both ranked close, why in the world would you trade? Because you're going to get one of the two at number two. Now, here's Uh, something interesting that I've seen from some mocks, and these are actually mocks that I think are credible. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I've seen a few where they put Will Levis as the number one, not because of, I don't think it's because of raw talent. I think people believe that he's going to be 
the most NFL ready. I don't know what your opinion on that is, but I still feel like Bryce Young to me feels like the number one overall pick for whoever gets it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shit on Will Levis and I'm only using this comparison f- not because of how I project their NFL careers, but Will Levis jumping up over more established quarterbacks from college is uh, is very Zach Wilson, mm-hmm. where we saw him jump up over over uh, Justin Fields. And I just don't think it makes sense. If you draft him, draft him, that's fine. I just don't see you drafting him over two guys that just had absolutely elite and our college careers. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see it either. I just thought it was interesting. Oh, I mean, you know, you're going to see it. People talk about it, and especially after the pro days is they're going to hype him up after his pro day. And, and there's I'm not knocking him. I I haven't watched enough about him to have knocks on him. But it's the level of talent playing at either Alabama or Ohio State versus Kentucky is night and day. And the comp, you know, the the qualifications he's put up, the numbers he's put up as a college passer pale in comparison. So to draft him ahead of him just seems silly to me. And it happens every year. I mean, look at uh, Trey Lance. The 49ers traded up thinking that is their guy. And the Jets took Wilson as their guy. And he passed up a much more accomplished college passer in Justin Fields. Um, so it happens. Who knows? But uh, it just it just doesn't make sense to me at this point. And, you know, there's the Will Levis, if he looks great in his pro day and, you know, his arrow starts pointing up, that's bad for the Bears because the more quarterbacks that look viable as first round options, the worse that the worst value right. they can get out of that number one, unless somebody just really falls in love with a guy. All it takes is one team to fall in love with a guy, which is and, we've seen plenty of times happens. Yeah. I mean, like, you know what? The Texans could fall in love with, with CJ Stroud. And like we can't live without CJ Stroud. And, and if they think Houston, I mean, uh, Indianapolis is going to trade up with the bears they could just be like, you know, we're going to move up, pay the, pay the price of the Piper. And, you know, the tax on that's probably going to be a second round pick. You know, well, I'd, I'd love to get into a bidding war, be in the middle of a bidding war, first round yeah. picks. Yeah. I, I it, like the idea of Ryan Poles being like, hmm, you know, maybe I don't want to trade back. Look how shiny that QB is. And the other teams go, wait, what are you doing? We want that. Uh Oh. There's the phone. I'm getting closer to the phone. Is he... <laughs> I'm picking up the phone. He's doing Mr. Burns fingers. <laughs> I mean, what did what did the Bears trade up from from where to to where to go with the Giants to get Justin Fields? Let's see, it was eleven. They traded up from twenty to eleven. Okay, so 20 to 11. So if you go by the points on that, um, 1482 to 17. So really, to move up that 1482 to 1785, you're looking at like 300 points. So that should have been like a fifth round pick, but the Bears gave up their future first rounder. So again, the Bears gave up a lot of value to move up. And, they did. And, you know, that's that's what you have to do is you have to gauge, is it worth it for you to move back? You have to see who is available, who you rank high. I mean, and, and, and as I was trying to say before is, you know, people are like, oh, well, the Bears need a lot of things, but are a lot of picks better than less picks with a blue chip player because 
if if Will Anderson's your guy, and I'm just going to put it out there, is the number of quarterback pressures he's had in his college career in three years just dwarfs most everybody else that's come out in the recent years. Um, it, it, you know, their college careers, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, the Chase Young, uh, you know, like they just just absolutely demolished it. If you look at him and you're like, you know what, that's a guy we look at as a 15 sack a year guy. It's hard for you to pass him up for, you know, like two or three mid-level starters, right? Right. And that's that's the the part where you're like I have to balance this out is you know in the NBA trading away a superstar for a bunch of picks t- typically the team that gets the superstar gets has the better of the draft cuz you know three three regular starters don't equal a superstar same thing is is if if you deem somebody as a superstar you don't want to trade so far back that you're like all right we got a pretty good player but not an elite player and you know you can you can find stop gaps at every position but you know you you can't find elite players everywhere and so that's my concern. If like you go, you know what, Will Anderson or Jalen Carter, those are guys that they're blue chip. We expect them to be all perennial, all pro, you know, possibly Hall of Fame guys. You know, do you pass them up for a guy that's, you know, maybe makes a couple of Pro Bowls? I don't know. You got to, you have to balance that out. Maybe if you get three guys that, that are, you know, Pro Bowl alternates versus one elite guy that works itself out in the wash, but you have to really evaluate. And I recognize the if the Bears trade back twice in the first round, that um uh that they're probably waving the white flag for next year as far as competing for, you know, more than just a playoff spot. But I, I just feel that, you know, I recognize there's a lot of holes to fill. But you have to balance the n- number of bites at the apple versus the quality of bites at the apple. Yeah, I mean, and again, it also depends on how, how far you draft back. And, you know, I mean, some high picks don't work out. Some high p- uh, lower picks work better. Some high picks work great. Some don't. Some low picks work better. So, again, it, you could go over the scenarios over and over and over and over and over again. But I just want the draft to be here already. Right. I mean, I, I have a lot of fun doing those mock draft simulators. I just I try to be realistic about it. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's fun. You're like, oh, man, how how much can I, you know, totally, you know, destroy this draft and and how much can i extract from my picks and come up with something absolutely ridiculous but at the end of the day when i'm if i'm really trying to do a realistic mock you you start with a realistic trade because again the bears are probably going to trade out of that first spot but you know i think ideal is if you can if you can compare get Houston and Indy competing or uh, you get um, if you get uh, you know Seattle and Indy competing or Vegas and and Indy competing and you're still staying in that that two to seven range I, I think that's a good spot because you can still get one of those top edge rushers and um and and still do well. You know, or who knows? The Bears could just say, "You know what? 
we're just going to plug the defense with veterans and high upside rookies. And we're going to go balls out and build our offense and trade back into the, you know, the 15, the, the 15 range and get a ton of value and draft one of those, the top wide receivers. That's a possibility as well. You know, where you're like, you know what, we're, we're just going to go with, uh, adding, you know, we'll give up 30 points a game and, and we'll just try to beat you with the offense. Uh, you know, who knows? They've, they've got a philosophy and they're going to run with it. If they think, if they think that, uh, you know, they're not going to be true competitors for a playoff spot. Maybe they just sink all of their resources on one side of the football and, and fix and, and fix, you know, one side of the ball and just try to stop gap the other side. Maybe. I mean, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they go heavily defensive against the strong wills of everybody else. I mean, look at last year. Look what Ryan Poles did last year with his, with his first two picks. He drafted a safety in a corner. Yeah. I I would not be shocked if they kept doing that. And people are going to be angry. And I'm not saying I fully would agree with it. But I would not be surprised if they heavily drafted defensive players. Obviously, they would address the offensive line. They would address. I'm not saying they neglect that, but I, I could see a lot of picks being focused on bettering the defense. Uh, Kevin Fishbane reported that the Bears are going to be heavily involved in free agency in the offensive line. Right, a- and, and that's another reason why. And you know what? It makes sense because, like, sure, if you get young guys and develop them, that's that's better for the long run, but you know what? It's, it's also involves a lot more risk. It's a lot safer of a bet. St- signing free agent offensive lineman is, is one of the safer bets as far as, uh, as far as free agency goes and you, you pay them, but they come in and they play, you know, to where you expect them to. And, and they've got a lot of money to spend. Use the draft resources to, to plug all the other holes, and and give your quarterback an opportunity. Another thing that was funny to me, and I saw somebody point this out. Do you know what the total, at this point, the total wide receiver, uh, salary for twenty twenty three for the entire Bears? rostered wide receivers is for next year. So factoring in Chase Claypool, Equinemius St. Brown and Darnell Mooney, basically. And Valus Jones. And Valus Jones. I mean, I know Equinemius St. Brown's extension was like one point some million. So it was I, I think I think you have Simba Webster too under contract. Uh, give me the total. What is it? Eleven point three million dollars in quarter or in wide receivers. That is not a lot of money. To put that into perspective, there are thirty wide receivers in the NFL that will make more than that themselves in twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, you know, and and you know, just just to throw f- fuel on the fodder because it is that season, and again. We're recording this on February 6th. The draft isn't until the end of April. So we've got all, all the rest of February, all of March, and most of April left before this is all said and done here. Keenan yeah. Allen, Keenan Allen is rumored to be a possible cap casualty, as well as Khalil Mack. You're How- thinking it, aren't you? I, uh, <laughs> I'm totally thinking it. If we brought Khalil Mack back on a team friendly deal to play one side and Will Anderson on the other, I'm not mad at that. It's way better. It's infinitely better than what we had this year. You're totally <laughs> thinking it. You are, you are. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, wouldn't it be funny 
if you traded away Khalil Mack, you freed your cap space, you didn't get much draft capital, but you got, got you some. Got a, you got a second round pick. Got a second rounder, that's fine. But then you brought him back for cheaper. Wouldn't yeah. that be something? Is you rented him for a year and dumped so much salary cap and rented him for a year and you got Jaquan Brisker out of it. Yeah. So if, okay, let, let's play a little uh, scenario here. If you, if Khalil Mack does get cut, I mean, they got to eat that money. The uh, I always want to call them San Diego, the chargers. That's uh-huh. they, they took all of that on. They did. So they got to take care of that. And then if you were to bring him back, how would you structure that deal? You, you, it's a new deal. It's a brand new deal. Cause if they cut him. No, I they, know. I'm just yeah. saying that. What, how, oh. what would you give him? What would you pay him? Oh, I'm sure you're going to have to pay him 15 million a year, but you, you sign him to a two year deal. So you give him a two year deal. Okay. I, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Um, let's see. All right. So right now, as of February 6th, before free agency, before the draft, because you know what, based on the number of draft picks you have, they slot you how much money you're going to have to spend on your rookies. And so that's a several million dollar pool before all of that. The Los Angeles chargers are over 20 million over the cap. How much over the cap? Over their 20.26 million dollars over the cap. Holy smokes. <clears throat> You're not going to get rid of Joey Bosa. No. So, let's say you designate Khalil Mack as a as a post 61 uh cut. He's what, 32, Khalil Mack? He is 32. 32, yeah. All right. That brings you all, all the way up to above water. And then you'll have at 2.6 left to spend. So it takes you, clears you out of the red by cutting Khalil Mack as a uh, as a post 6-1 cap casualty. And if they wanted to get that money all off the books now, you could des- you could just cut him, and that takes you to uh, 1.86 in the red. If you do both Keenan Allen and Khalil Mack as post-6-1 cuts, it brings you to $20 million of cap space. Just and saying. And when you have that much in the red as it is right now i mean you look at the possible casualties that the chargers would have i mean so here's a listed one this is from jpa khalil mack keenan allen as you said Uh michael davis matt filler Corey lindsley and gerald everett Corey lindsley i don't i'm not very I'm not really familiar with their uh, center, but their center, Corey Lindsley. He's good. Um, He's just in his thirties though. Yeah. I mean, so who, who else was it? So it was Lindsley, Allen, Gerald Mack. Everett. Uh, where is he on here? Gerald Everett. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Matt Feller, Feller, left guard. Yeah. All right. You cut all those. That gives you $36 million of cap space to spend. Yeah, I mean, Keenan Allen's got to be making quite a bit then. He is making uh, $21.7 million. Yeah, okay. Wasn't he hurt a lot last year, too? He was. I don't have any interest in Keenan Allen. I don't either. I'm not saying get Keenan Allen. I'm just, I'm just curious I'm, how this is going to work out for the Chargers. I'm just saying is, if you're the Bears, and you could bring back Khalil Mack on a, on a mediocre deal, and you add a true stud like Will Anderson on the one side, Khalil Mack on the other, 
good gravy could that wreak havoc. And even if Khalil Mack isn't the same guy he once was, that gives you still a pretty good player to have, veteran presence, you know, kind of that whole thing. If you bring him back for two years and you're paying him, what, $15, $16 million a year, you you have all the salary cap space in the world, so it's not going to hurt you. You're not going to be like, oh, we're wasting precious money on an older Khalil Mack. It was important to cut him the first time by trading him because he was making a hell lot more money and they were currently in a cap bind when Ryan Poles took over the team. But now things are different with Khalil Mack if he's potentially cut and you're not going to have him to pay that salary that you dumped off to the Chargers for two years. I do it. Honestly, at the very least, you're getting a veteran guy who's, you know, well, who even if he's not at his prime anymore, I think can still give you something if he's on the field. There's a big difference between a two-year deal that you can afford with a ton of cap space versus a guy that was making just an albatross amount of money for a guy who was over 30. You can pay the over 30s for cheaper deals short term, but under the Bears terms that Ryan Pace gave him on that extension, <clears throat> that just you you had to clear that money off the books. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, is uh, he the Khalil Mack of 2018 or from the Raiders? No, no. Is he better than anybody you had rushing the passer last year? Absolutely. I mean, that could be said for pretty much anybody (laughs) in the NFL. I mean, let's be real. I'm pretty sure DeCron Brisker finished with the most sacks on the team. Your safety, your rookie safety, your rookie safety had led your team in quarterback sacks. And and here's just, um, here's a stat line for what Khalil Mack did with the chargers last year. So last year he played in all 17 games, recorded eight sacks, 33 solo tackles, 50 combined tackles, and was an 11 AV. So if you brought that back to the bears, you know, he was a pro bowler. If that really means a lot to you these days, but yeah, if you, if you brought that same type of production to the bears, he would far and away be the best guy you would have on the roster right now. And if you're able to shore up that front seven and you had a veteran in there, Khalil Mack, and if he were to give you, you know, 50 combined tackles and 30 ish solo tackles and somewhere between seven to nine stacks, then yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, you go back and you look at his freaking 2018 numbers where in 14 games he had 12 and a half sacks and, you know, 37 solo tackles and was a 17 AV, but still an 11 AV for a, you know, if you're into the AV value stuff for an over 30 pass rusher, still, still pretty solid, still pretty solid. Yeah. And again, way better than anything that the bears had. And it brings back a fan favorite. I'm, I'm here for it. And again, you know, winning is the only thing that matters, but you know, bringing back a fan favorite and winning double thumbs up. Right. And this isn't a situation where you're like, okay, we need one more guy to polish off a super bowl run. We have limited cap space. Let's bring in 32-year-old Khalil Mack. No, you're trying to build for something. You have 90 plus million dollars in cap space, and you're looking to try to fill a spot and kind of bring in that veteran presence. There's a big difference there. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would be for that too, and I remember thinking that when we traded away Khalil Mack, I thought, okay, the Chargers are going all in this year, but we knew they were going to be in a bind. Like they were really trying to go for it this year. Because what did you say? 20 million over the cap? 20.26, I think. Yeah. So you knew that they were going all out this year. 
and you knew that there were going to be some sacrifices. I just didn't realize it was that far over for them. And I don't even think they're the most. Um, jeez, I'm used to that always going to the Saints. That honor, <laughs> the Saints. I mean, the Saints have such a bad cap space that they had the their, you know, Hall of Fame level coach quit. Yeah, so the Chargers aren't even in the bottom five. Um, number one is the Saints. They are There's, the Saints. Yep, sixty point three five million over the cap. Oh my Bucks, goodness! The Bucks are two, even after Tom Brady comes off the books. Right, fifty five million over the cap. The Titans are three at twenty three point five over the cap. The Vikings are four at 23 and a half over the cap and the Jaguars are five at 22 over the cap. And then there's the bears to the most cap space in football though. By a lot though, you know, they said that the projected cap went down. We were thinking $115 million about, but it's really like $92 million of cap space. We have only $92 million. Right. I mean, it's there, some of it is future deals and et cetera, et cetera, is it's going to wash a little bit because the cap is figured how much cap space you have versus the top 53 contracts on your roster. So if the 53rd contract is like $1.5 million, when you add a contract that moves that contract down, um, you also gain sort of $1.5 million back of that. Right. Um, because you're pushing those contracts down. So part of that is, is you know, there, there's some still some dead cap space. We still have dead cap space from Danny Trevathan. Yeah. Um, that's so, a name we haven't talked about in a while. Uh, but man, um, for the Vikings, if let's see, getting rid of Adam Thielen or Harrison Smith or Zadarius Smith or Dalvin Cook. Those are the names that they're looking at to uh, in, in order to get under the uh, the cap. I feel like Adam Thielen would be a big primary candidate for salary sacrifice. So if they get rid of Adam Thielen, Harrison Smith, Zadarius Smith, and Dalvin Cook, it pushes them to the point where they could fill their roster with bottom feeders and sign their draft picks. Yeah. And that would, yeah. 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 Not our problem. Not our problem. Not our monkey, not our zoo. (laughs) <laughs> oh man hey uh i figured on this show before we move on to another sport that uh we do a little super bowl preview prediction sure <clears throat> so i read a stat today somebody posted this let me pull it up so i can give proper credit to who made this put this stat together uh field yates so the chiefs record this year 16 and 3 overall including playoffs. 546 points scored. Six all pros including a Kelsey brother and their QB, AFC's number 1 seed. The Eagles this year, 16 and 3 overall record including playoffs, 546 points scored, the same as the uh same as the Chiefs, six all pros including a Kelsey brother and their QB, NFC's number 1 seed. So both teams scored 546 points, six all pros, has a Kelsey brother and their QB as a pro bowler or um, for all pros. That's pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. Yep. And I think that this is a really good matchup 
you're getting two teams that were both number one in their conference. This was this was the playoffs where truly the better teams won. You could argue that the Bengals could have held neck and neck, and hey, they did. The Chiefs won on a last second field goal. That was a very close game. And I know that there was some controversy in that game, but you know, both teams had their chances to win it, and the Chiefs took advantage of their chance to win it, and they did. And the I mean, the Eagles were clearly, clearly the best team in the NFC. Even yes. when you saw the 49ers in that run with Brock Purdy, you said, you know what? I think they could give the Eagles trouble, but I would still take the Eagles. And then Brock Purdy got hurt and they had to Caleb Haney their way in the NFC championship. And it all just, you know, it all just ended poorly for the 49ers. But the Eagles were probably the favorites to win the Super Bowl since the first few weeks of the season. I know going into the season, the betting favorites were mostly the Bills. But when you saw the Eagles play, you're like, okay, this team is probably going to be one of the favorites, if not the favorite. And then in Kansas City, when you have Pat Mahomes, it's hard to bet against them, even with the Bills and the Bengals. I mean, I thought that the Bengals arguably could have been the team to beat because they were the defending AFC champs and they had had the Chiefs number the past two years. But let's be real, Pat Mahomes is probably the single best player in football right now at least the best quarterback. And I think that on the field in the Super Bowl, I think the Eagles are the better all around team, but Pat Mahomes is the best player on that field. Would you agree or disagree? Yes, absolutely. Without even question. And I think here are going to be the two questions. Will the Eagles defense be able to take advantage of a, and I put this in quotes, banged up Pat Mahomes or is Pat Mahomes going to be able to do what he can and outslug Jalen Hurts and I don't mean this to disrespect Jalen Hurts but you saw the Eagles blow out the 49ers really in the second half of that game because the 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 49ers defense was on the field like 90 percent of the time it was going to wear out but I thought that despite everything, even despite some of the score going into the fourth quarter, like in the third quarter, I thought that the 49ers defense was playing pretty well. They just eventually got tired. And I think Jalen Hurts is awesome. That team is good. I just, I feel like offensively, I trust Pat Mahomes a little more than Jalen Hurts, but I also trust the Eagles defense more than I trust the Chiefs defense. So what's your prediction? So tough. I think it's going to be a one score game. I know that it's a very cliche. Oh, it's a big matchup. One score game. But I truly believe it's, I think we could get a game like we saw in Kansas city in the AFC championship. So, so what's your prediction? I'm going to say, I'm going to say, 27 24 Eagles. I think that the Eagles are going to make that one defensive play that's going to make the difference. Whether it's an interception, whether it's a sack, whether it's a big stop towards the end of the game, it's going to be a good tight battle where you're going to see both QBs do some really special things. You're going to see the defense do some special things as well. I feel like the Eagles facing Pat Mahomes, obviously facing Pat Mahomes is the hardest QB to face, but if they were to face the Bengals, I think the Bengals would be a double threat because the Bengals can run the ball very efficiently. Whereas I think the Eagles, as good as Pat Mahomes is, I think if they keep if they could keep an element of their scoring at bay, the Chiefs, then they'll be able to make that big stop, if that makes sense. I'm going to go Chiefs. 31-27. Okay, I respect that. What's your rationale? 
I think Andy Reid is the best coach on the field. I would agree. And I think that Patrick Mahomes is the best player on the field, which I think we both just agreed on. Yep. Um, and I'm going to say that uh, Travis Kelsey is the second best player on the field. And I think the Eagles, are, their big Achilles heel this year has been stopping the run. And I think Patrick Mahomes is the X factor is going to be him being able to, he's not going to do Justin Fields type runs. Especially if his legs a little gimpy. That's why I'm a little weary about it. But he is going to be able to chip away at those eight, 10, 12 yard runs all day long. And I think it's going to give the Eagles fits and we're going to see them suddenly get tired. The, the, I, I, I wouldn't be the surprised. Chief, the Chiefs are going to run the ball, whether it be with the running backs or with Mahomes or screen type runs with, with Kelsey, that tight end screen. I think they're going to do that. They're going to be able to score. And the Eagles have thrived on big plays. I mean, big explosive plays. Yes. And I think the Chiefs are going to contain those better than most teams. Okay. I do agree with them being able to game plan against the Eagles. I do. I just, I think that they could come up with that big stop. I'm just a little weary about Pat Mahomes' leg. There is part of me that thinks part of the, I'm not saying he's faking it, but it might have been kind of overblown theatrics a little bit. Um, not saying like he wasn't in any pain, but I, you know, well, I'm I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing that it was not a high ankle sprain; it was just a normal ankle sprain, right? Which high ankle sprain, legitimately, that would be a miracle that he played the next right, week. right, a regular ankle sprain. It's just a little sore. And you're going to be a little ginger on it and you can do things, which is you're going to feel it every so often, which is what we're seeing. So let me ask you this. Would you agree with me? The point I made that it would be, it would have been a worse matchup if the Eagles had to play the Bengals with their run threat. Yes. I would agree. Though their their uh, running back might not have started this Super Bowl for reasons, but I still think they'd have a better running game. But yeah. Um, but either way, I'm. It'll be nice to see the Super Bowl, and then. Uh, and sorry, what was your what was your score prediction? Chiefs thirty one twenty seven. Okay. I'm just uh, I'm taking notes here. We'll see who is closer. And I want to see what what does points bet have the uh, the odds at here. I mean, it seems like all the odds that I've read they're pretty close. Like no one's a heavy heavy favorite, which we would expect, right? What's that? We would expect that the odds are pretty close. Like no one's a heavy favorite. Oh yeah, I'm just seeing good what matchup. It, what they have it as. Um, come on, points bet. It's like in the, the the odds are constantly shifting, and I think you know we're gonna see over this week who could be active, who could be out, and it seems like the big all guns right. are all playing, but there's gonna be some guys out, obviously. All right, the Eagles on points bet are a point and a half favorite. I read a stat somewhere. Was it that? I, I I don't know if I'm getting this completely wrong, but I think they were saying the color of the uniform has been very one sided in terms of winner. <laughs> like the white uniform has triumphed. More than the colored uniform, unless I got that backwards. I, I saw that briefly and I'm I'm trying to visually remember all the Super Bowls because last year. Well, last year, the Rams won. Mm-hmm. Were, were they wearing white or color? I don't remember. 
I think they I were honestly, wearing the color. I thought they were too. The year before the Buccaneers won, I think they were wearing white. The year before that was the Chiefs. They beat the 49ers. The Rams were wearing color when they lost to the Patriots in 18. 17, the Eagles were wearing the green. And then the year before that, the the great comeback, the Tom Brady comeback. Oh, I, I take that they, back. The Rams wore the white uniforms. They were wearing the white uniforms. Yep. Okay. And then in 16, the great comeback, they were wearing the white. The Patriots were against the Falcons. And the year before that, that was the Broncos and the Panthers. That one I don't remember. Who wore what? The Broncos in orange was, or was Peyton Manning wearing white? Yeah, here we go. Through 56 Super Bowls, the team that wore the white jersey won 36 times. There you go. Because remember, when the Bears lost in 06, the Colts were wearing white. We were wearing our navy. I mean, and we wore our white in 85. I mean, it's, it's a good record, but it's not like crazy because it's, you know, 50 50 would be 28 and 28. So it's like eight Still wins better. above. Oh, it's better. So the Eagles are wearing the white. But was it? I, I thought they had a stat that was like over the past 15 years. Let's see. Um, I'm just trying to remember. I remember, unfortunately, the Packers were wearing green when they won. Mm-hmm. And then the Giants were wearing uh, white when they beat the Patriots the second time. I remember that. Yeah, so the Rams, the Buccaneers, Patriots, Patriots, Broncos, Patriots, Seahawks, Ravens. So the... Yeah, so let's see. Yeah, the Rams, Bucks, Patriots, Patriots, Broncos, Patriots, Seahawks, Ravens, Giants, Saints, Steelers, Giants, Colts. So they, they has a pretty good record. Now, yeah, they, they not, all wore the white. Um Uh, now I kind of want to bet the Eagles. <laughs> Too late. Already wrote it down. Uh, no, I'm talking about putting money on it. Oh, not my pointless pride bet. No, that's still good, too. I'm going to put. All right. I... How would you determine the Super Bowl winner? By the uniforms they were wearing. Who had the prettiest colors? Why do these all have purple crayon on them? <laughs> you know, I. I was in a, uh, I was in a March Madness pool, and the person that won, was like I've never seen a college basketball game in my life. Like, how'd you pick it? Uh, color of the uniforms, or whether I liked the mascot better? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a fifty-fifty chance. Yeah. Uh, where do you want to move on from here? <sighs> we just had the NHL All Star Game. I don't know if yeah. you watched any of that. <laughs> I, I didn't, honestly. I mean, I wa- you know what? Take that back. I watched a little bit of the games. Um, the, the format's weird, but I was watching from the hotel room in, in Detroit. Um, man, it was just all offense. And having As si- usual. Sidney Crosby and uh, Ovechkin on the same line is a cheat code. Yeah, I mean, they were just having fun. They were... Just scrimmaging against everybody else. I I forgot who the goalie was, but there was one where there was a stolen pass and then a pass to to Crosby and then back to Ovechkin, back to Crosby. And that goalie was just like, I give up. There's really, I mean, I literally can't do anything. And then Crosby just lifted it straight over the outstretched leg for an easy, easy goal. I was like, is such a cheat mode. It was kind of funny because you saw Crosby score a few goals and Alex Ovechkin, the guy who usually likes to 
net the goal. He was very unselfish. Well, because this doesn't count towards uh, chasing Gretzky. <laughs> well, no, of course not. But uh, it was just kind of funny to see. Uh, but um, uh, all we had was Seth Jones in the hardest shot competition, which he had like a 93 mile an hour shot. And that he was it. placed last. Yeah. He was literally just, uh, hey, the Blackhawks need somebody in it. And I mean, Seth Jones has played fine this year, but, you know, you wouldn't think like all-star overall. They just needed somebody. Uh, just want to point out, in the all-time goals leading leaders, Ovechkin 812, Gretzky 894. Wow. We're getting there. Well, remember, he scored a hat trick, including the 800th against the Blackhawks in Chicago. I was watching that one. Yep. Yep. But, man, he's, uh, 8-12, And he's still making it look so easy. He's been around since I was a kid. Fifteen twenty-six or eight. Oops. So he's averaging a goal every one point six games. Yeah, it's pretty good. So he needs 82 more goals, 83 to, to beat him. Uh, it's 135 more games. That's two seasons. Every goal, he gets closer and closer. Yep. I mean, it'd be amazing if he just went out uh, this season with just a, a fury and and just really really ramped it up. Yeah. I mean, he, he, it doesn't look like he's lost a step in his game. He's still playing really well. Uh, That's amazing. I'm totally rooting for him though. And then there's the Hawks. You know what though? I'm starting to feel better about where they're going. The farm system evaluations the latest ones are coming out and the blackhawks are trending upward yeah the the one from the athletic they have them ranked as five that's incredible and you see some of what the rockford ice hogs have you see how reichel plays and you saw some of the action the hl all-star game you know they got they got I mean, some talent there and you got talent way below i mean without you know, uh Honestly, it's a lot of that talent is not in, um, not in Rockford. It's no, a lot of it's well below. Yeah. I mean, but uh, you watch Reichel in Rockford yes. and a few of those, you know, other not as known prospects, but guys who could be guys. And you're like, okay, Reichel looks good. He looks really good in his last NHL stint. And there are a few other guys in Rockford. You're like, okay, these could be guys. But like you said, way below some of the recent gets, like in the WHL, looking pretty good. Yeah. So their their rankings of their top their top prospects, Kevin Korchinski, eighteen years old, left uh, handed defenseman for, uh, playing with the Seattle Thunderbirds. Mm-hmm. Um, two Lucas Reichel, who's playing with twenty years old, left winger playing for the Ice Hogs, and has got a cup of coffee with the Blackhawks. Um, Frank Nazar, 18 year old center playing for the university of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, number four, Ryan green is a 19 year old center playing at Boston university five, Sam Rinzel, right-handed defenseman playing for the water blue Blackhawks, 18 years old, Ethan Del Mastro left-handed defenseman, 19 years old playing for Sarnia sting. Uh, seven drew Camesso, the goalie playing 20 years old, playing for Boston university. Number eight, uh, Arvid Soderblom, 
23 years old, who's played for both the Ice Hogs and the Hawks this year. Mm-hmm. Um, who's looked really strong. Yeah. M- much closer. I mean, they, they're going to say not as talented, but much closer to being a, a guy. Um, Ilya Savinov, 21 year old center for AK bars, Kazan and number 10, Colton doc, 20 year old center playing for the Seattle Thunderbirds. That's Kirby's little brother, Kirby's little brother. Um, you know, and that's not even, you know, in top 10, you don't even have Isaac Phillips, uh, who's playing well for the ice hogs mm-hmm. or Vlasic who's playing well for the ice hogs. That was the other one that I saw on the ice hogs. I'm like, okay, that guy could be something. Uh huh. Um, and you know, all of that, you know, totally goes out the window too, is if you get Connor Bedard, because that shoots you to number one. Yeah. Easily. <laughs> yeah. Easily yeah. shoots you right to the top because you're like, oh, hey, they've just got, you know, elite. Um, if your top prospects were Bedard, Korchinski, Nazar, Reichel, sitting pretty good and here's the other great thing too these are like 18 19 20 year olds not the old-fashioned stan bowman well he's 24 but he's got upside yeah and not to mention we haven't even made trades yet at the trade deadline because we've got about a month before the trade deadline we have not made trades and we already in the next two drafts have uh two first rounders this year two second rounders this year two third rounders this year, two first rounders next year, two second rounders next year, and two third rounders next year. Just think if we could trade a little more and get a little more draft capital. I I mean, you know, uh, you're going to trade guys. Absolutely. Like there's no way you don't stand Pat or you stand Pat. You're going to flip guys. Right. The biggest question is Kane and Taze. And it sounds like Kane hasn't made his decision yet. It well, I mean, does does the rumors of his hip make the the decision for him? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: whether or not he's traded, he's not going to bring back a massive haul at this point. I mean, you have the injury concern and. Even if you watch him and say, okay, if you actually sit and watch him, he's not playing bad, but he is not putting up the numbers. No. Um, you know, the rumors are the Rangers may have interest. Uh, the stars may have interest. Um, you know, would he waive it to go play with the bread man? That sounds, that sounds like a believable option. Could you imagine those two in New York together with all the other talent they have around them? Right. And, you know, and what if, what if Kane leaves and then comes back? They re-sign him. Possible. I, I mean, I think that's really possible. I mean, if the Blackhawks go to him and say, hey, listen, you know, we want you to finish out your career as a Blackhawk, but can we rent you out for like these next two months? I mean, if they did it, great. But if they trade him away and they said, you know what, we're just completely rebuilding this thing, I'd be okay with that too. I- I'm okay with that too. But, you know, I- I'm looking forward to the next great Blackhawks team. But, that would, I mean, let's just say can't, that did do that. They trade Kane. He plays, you know, a- April or, you know, March, April, May, June, four months for somebody else. And they re-sign him and he plays four more years and then hangs him up. That's one of those, like, those, like, trivia things is where did... What other team did Patrick Kane play for? And then you're like, oh man, I totally forgot about those four months that he played for the Rangers. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, or somebody just posts a picture of him playing for, you know, the the stars. And it's just a weird thing. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm starting to feel better about the direction of this team. I am too. I am too. Is you're like, okay. uh, You know, before it's always, it's always scary when you can't see the bottom. And I think we've, we are really close to the bottom. And after, you know, the, the second half of the season, I mean, we're already in the second half, but the, after the trade deadline until the end of the season, I think that is rock bottom. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at that several different perspectives. I think that's a fair way to look at it. I think we've almost already hit rock bottom, and that was last year for a number of reasons. But I think that's also fair, too. Yeah, I mean. In terms of on-ice products, you're probably right. Yeah, we're, we're, all right, if, you know, we're either right at the cusp of rock bottom or just hit rock bottom a little bit ago. But we're right there. We we know what rock bottom looks like. And we we see a brighter day ahead. And you're like, okay, this team, this team is possibly going to get a generational talent in the draft. They've already got one of the best list of prospects in NHL. They've got in the in the first two rounds uh, or first three rounds of the next two drafts, they have two, four, six, 12 draft picks in the first three rounds of the next two drafts. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Like that's, that's straight. Awesome. Yeah. So they get, they have their own one, two, and three in both drafts. Then they have this year, they have Tampa's one Tampa's two Dallas is three next year. Tampa's one Vancouver's two and Ottawa's three. It's like we have a shit ton of draft picks. Um, so we will add to that. And I'm sure they'll try to package those to move up. But um, and next year, we're probably not going to be that good either. So it's probably going to be another very good pick. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we could legit be worse next year. But your farm system could be like the best. Now, if you landed Connor Bedard and he starts with you right away, you wouldn't be good right away, but you would definitely be more entertaining. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, do do you p- put him right in the NHL right away? I don't know. I mean, he's he's how old is he? <laughs> like 17? 17? 17-ish. I mean, I feel like players of his caliber – like when you had Ovechkin and Crosby and Kane and uh, Connor McDavid, y- you know, you were pretty much going to the show. All right. He turns 18 in July. He's 17 years old. And he's not a big dude either. Um, no, he's not. He's uh, 5'9", 185 pounds. Yeah, that's that's not big, but he's also really damn good. Um, but I, I mean, it's it's crazy, and and we've got like what thirteen games left before the the tra- the deadline, the trade deadline, and uh, and. This this could be the last 13 games we ever see Kane and Taves in a Blackhawks uniform. It could be. It could be. I, I, I'm just, I'm sorry. I, I'm right now, my mind is still thinking how the hell we fleece the lightning for first rounders for Brandon Hagel. Right. I liked Brandon Hagel, but I, I can't believe we got a better haul for him than Alex to bring it. That's the way things work sometimes. Yeah, I know. I also think, too, there's another element to this Blackhawks rebuild. I really like Luke Richardson. I really like him as a coach. I I do, too. That team plays hard, even if they're getting their brains beat in. When they're losing, it is purely just because of a lack of talent. But they, uh, if this was a Jeremy Colleton system, 
or like even like I think Derek King, you know, he just had a job to do. I like him as an assistant coach, but if you gave either of those guys this team, I I I think they're even worse. If you were under Colleton's system, you'd probably have half the number of wins you have right now. Probably be better for your tank, but I think that establishing a good culture under Richardson is a good thing. Right. Man, uh, I, I, I really, I knew we stocked up on draft capital, but I am just laughing that the next two years we have four first round picks, four second round picks and four third round picks. Yes. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and it could go up. It could go up. It could go up. I mean, you know, uh, they're they're saying that you know you could uh, uh, the Rangers could give up their first two picks in the draft for for Kane. In yeah. that case, in that case, you would have three first rounders, three second rounders. Oh my God. Just sprinkling Connor Bedard, and I am feeling so so good. Uh, and Bleacher Nation is is saying a trade that would work is Taves to the Avalanche for um for a first round pick. So then they would have four first rounders in this year's draft. <laughs> Ryan Poles would call up um, Kyle Davidson. Hey, you want to help me? Give me some advice. Oh, man. Maybe, maybe the Blackhawks can trade one of those picks to the Bears. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But the only other bit of uh, Blackhawks news is uh, Bobby Hull passed away. Yes. Yes, he did. It's it's a weird thing because Mm -hmm. as a hockey player, you're like, man, one of the all time greats, just phenomenal hockey player. But as good of a hockey player he was, he was as bad of a person. He was a shitty dude. Yeah. And I know people who know a lot of ins with the Blackhawks. And they've known Bobby Hall and they're like, yeah, he was just a complete a-hole. And I even heard a story that people at the Hockey Hall of Fame would prepare for him arriving because they just knew he was just a complete ass. And they're like, oh, God, he's coming back. And, you know, I've also heard some things about how he behaved and, you know, behind the scenes of the hockey. Like, just you, you never really heard anything good about the guy. and. Obviously, you heard he said some things and he did some things with his family years ago. It just it's a shame because he was one of the faces of Chicago sports. And it was in terms of goals and scoring and playing on the ice, the most accomplished Blackhawks player in history. But, you know, I I feel like more and more fans have kind of learned about some of the ugly stuff. And I feel like over the years, more and more people, including myself, really looked at the all-time Blackhawks grace and greats and were much, much more willing to embrace Stan Makita. And Stan Makita was worth embracing for a number of reasons. He used to live right by me when I was a kid. There were times we'd be looking over at a big Cadillac at the gas station. Oh, there's Stan Makita in his big, ugly sweater. And people really liked Stan Makita. And, you know... I mean, listen, my my dad grew up loving Bobby Hull and got a bunch of Bobby Hull signed stuff. And he was obviously a big part of like my dad's youth and watching hockey and and for many, many people. And, you know, I I say like you can hold on to those memories. We can hold on to the 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 joy we watched watching a player like that. But we also can't pretend like, you know, he just because it's not like he was just an asshole. Like if you're just an asshole, the fans like, okay, whatever. You're, you're just, you're just a dick, whatever. But when you hear about what he, I, what, I mean, what I've heard about what he did to his wife and I mean, domestic violence, anti-Semitism, yeah. racism. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really, uh, 
really hard to separate the player from the person at, it at is. a certain point. It's one that thing, point, like you is, said, yeah. it's if you know you're a jerk to fans or you know, like I, it's you're like okay, you know I I can sort of look past that, but at a certain point, um, you know, uh. When when you say Hitler had good ideas, yeah, that uh, he, uh, yeah, uh, not good, not good. Canada was too left wing for him. Uh, you know, uh, it's the domestic violence issues. Um, yeah, and you hear some really bad stuff about that. You know, is his daughter? Or I'm sorry. Uh, um. Was his daughter or his granddaughter that said something? Either his daughter or granddaughter became a lawyer for the victims of domestic violence. Um, Oh, yeah, it was his daughter because of what happened to his mother. Um, You know, so it's it's really tough to celebrate the legacy. And for a city that loves legacy and Mm -hmm. loves to honor the past, his his death just sort of happened and then was stopped talk, being talked about. Right. And uh, you heard that the Blackhawks were going to have just a mention and moment of silence for Hall, but they weren't going to do any patches or anything else honoring that. So they're trying to acknowledge it, but be very minimal about it. And I, I don't think that's a coincidence. No. Um, you know, it's... Uh... It's it's tough to honor him too hard. I mean, like whatever whatever you can say about the last several years of Jonathan Taves' play, and Jonathan Taves will never be on the ice. Bobby Hull. That's not a knock at him. Just just facts. Is you know on the day that Jonathan Taves dies, this city will have legit tributes because good guy, very good guy. Nobody has a bad thing to say about Jonathan Taves. You think not fans, not teammates, not nobody. Uh, John, really? I think some people were soured about the Kyle beach thing. (sighs) Okay. I, but he was like what 21 22 23 it wasn't I've... really what happened it's the way he reacted to it it wasn't the best fair. choice of words fair but it's a different stratosphere than bobby hole oh i agree i i completely agree i completely and utterly agree i'm not trying to equate it with bobby hall but i do think people in the hockey world look at this whole the whole blackhawks that the leadership of Tate, that whole thing, I think people do look at it a little differently now after the Kyle Beach thing. But I mean, Jonathan Taves, you know, he's got 50 more years left to live. Right. That's that, that when he passes, that's going to be, you know, there's going to be tributes. And what I'm saying is just the, the reaction will be significantly different than. Yeah. You, you're probably right. Yeah. Um, and assuming the Wurtz family still owns the team, they will honor that because he, the championships he brought. Um, I think Marion Hosa would be a really good example of like mourning and tributes. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, well, well, look, look, just compare, compare the Bobby Hull's death to Stan Makita's Stan Makita had a public memorial. Mm-hmm. At, at the United P- fans came in and filed through the atrium in front of his casket that you want to talk about apples and oranges. And I know it's two different sports and I know one's a player and one's an announcer, but I remember when Harry Carey died, mm-hmm. I waited in a long ass line to see they didn't have his casket. Uh, they had, well, it was, they had the a case with his glasses. Yeah. And 
I waited hours to go see that. And was it oh, the like most attended funeral in Chicago history? Oh, I, I something like I, that. I can't imagine whose would have been bigger. I mean, you know, it's just who, even if you weren't a Harry Carey fan, who hated Harry Carey? Like just beloved guy in this city. And, you know, like we, we mourn hard, you know, Walter Payton dying. Like it's, we, like you said, Makita dying, Bobby Hull. This is like a footnote. It happened. And the thing is, if he wasn't such a piece of crap, that this would have been a huge deal. Mm -hmm. This would be one of the all-time Chicago sports greats dying if he wasn't what he was off the ice. Yeah. Because, like, you you see people were very hesitant to talk about Bobby Hall because of his greatness on the ice was very conflicted with the off ice stuff. And again, if he just wasn't a very nice guy, like if he just wasn't nice to fans or he was just kind of a grouch, it's like, you know, people kind of like whatever with that stuff. But I mean, the more and more you hear about what he did off the ice, it, it's pretty horrific. Yep. Yep. I mean, <sighs> An article in the Toronto Star. Bobby Hull was a great hockey player and a miserable human being. Yeah. And, you know, I I was kind of one of those people. My whole approach to it was, you know, when I said, like, you know, Bobby Hull obviously left his mark on hockey history, but we also know the ugly side of it and just kind of left it there because there is... And I, I know this is a, you know, it's it's controversial to say, and I know that some people will have different opinions on this, but, you know, I, I kind of like, okay, he was a shit person, but am I going to just rag on a guy who just died? You know, I was kind of doing that balancing act. So I kind of just, I kind of just made it short and sweet. Like we can't ignore the bad stuff. We know he was, you know, a big part of, hockey and Blackhawks history, but you know, it is important to look at what happened on the off the ice. And I it just didn't not without going into much detail and elaboration. I mean, does, does that all make sense? Trying to find that balancing act. Right. Well, I mean, let's see, here's a quote from uh, another article. He was a fantastic hockey player and a horrible, horrible human being. And to pretend like uh, one of those things is somehow at odds with the other is fool's math. But then you have a dead spin article. <clears throat> Good riddance, Bobby Hull. Hull was a wife beater and a Nazi sympathizer who also played hockey well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I wouldn't. It's like, are we going to miss the person? No, but I also, I also understand he had friends and family. So I, I just, you don't want to respect bad people, but you also don't want to disrespect people associated that aren't guilty like he was. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I'm just like, you know what? He was a really bad dude. He, you know, and that's, that's that, you know, I, I didn't, didn't elaborate on like all the stuff that he did on the ice or, you know, explain this, this, and that I'm like, we know the history. We know it's not good. And just, you know, that was it. Didn't say much else. Yeah. And, and that article, the good riddance, Bobby Hull, Hull was a wife beater and a Nazi sympathizer, sympathizer who also played hockey well, written by Sam Fells. So uh, somebody that would know a lot. So it's a... Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it happened, and I don't want to shit on the dead, but... We also can't pretend it didn't happen either. Right. The bad stuff. That's where you try to find that balancing act. But, I mean, now that he's gone, they're going to have that one little moment of silence, and then it's just everyone's going to move forward. You're not, like I said, you're not going to have that 
patch. You're not going to, and when I mean everyone, I mean the, I mean the Blackhawks. They're not going to be doing a bunch of tri- It sounds like mm-hmm. tributes and patches. That's what I mean. It's just going to be like, all right, there's going to be our acknowledgement, and now onward we go. Right. Yeah. That's what I mean. Other people, you know, obviously people associated with it. There, it's obviously going to be very different, and I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm just saying the Blackhawks themselves are going to acknowledge it and then move forward. Right. That's what it sounds like for the reports I heard. Like you said, kind of a footnote almost. I think that's a good way to put it. All right. Should we talk about the bulls? Trade deadlines coming up. I don't, couple, I, I don't really have much to say, but it's, you know what this team, they, they stink. And then they put together two good wins. And I, I personally think you have to blow this team up. I don't really want to be a seven seed. Like that just gets you nowhere. No, this, this team is the way it's constructed. Just can't win. And I, I guess if I had to rank my preference for what they do at the trade deadline is one preference would be sellers sell off everything rebuild or have a plan like okay well you know you know we're going to move these pieces these pieces and these pieces like you know you're not going to resign vooch i don't think that makes sense no it doesn't why wouldn't you trade him and get something for him because otherwise he's just going to leave and you get him you lose him for nothing right um obviously even if they get along at it's it's obviously not working having both Demar and Zach be on the same team. Somebody's got to be the alpha. You can't have two two of those guys. Um, you know, trade Demar while his value is super high. Give give Pat Williams more shot opportunities. Let Zach Levine take the opportunity to be the guy and see where he goes with it. Maybe he flourishes, um, but at least you know. Um, you know, that would be my preference, to be sellers. Second preference would be, if you're not going to sell, stand pat. Because my fear is they become buyers. I Yeah, I don't, I do not want them to become buyers. I just don't know how they would become buyers. The only pseudo option I could see that I could buy would be if the Nets are truly going to tear things down is Ben Simmons. No, God, no. No. Just saying. I, I don't know. I wouldn't give up a lot for him. But I, he, he's he's a smooth playmaker. No, please no. But I'm I he I'm hearing rumors every direction. The Bulls could be buyers trying to get a point guard. The Bulls could stand pat. The Bulls could move, uh, you know, Kobe White or, uh, they could Andre move, Drummond. Andre Drummond. Io. I haven't heard IO. Um, I heard some rumors about IO a week or two ago, but those did kind of die off. Um, so you're hearing some trade rumors here and there, but you've, I've, I'm hearing the gamut of, of things and I, I have no idea what they're going to do. We've got, we've already seen one blockbuster trade where Kyrie Irving gets moved to Dallas. And that is a, that is a, an absolute sink or swim move because if that pays off, that pays off really well. But if that doesn't pay off, that turns out to be a dog shit trade. The fit seems just weird to me. I don't know. We'll we'll see. It does, but it could also just, it could be a great, you know, a thing where, you know, to lead them to possible championship. Um, Cause you've got, a guy that's got incredible talent and then playing with Luca, who's one of the best players in the league. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see. I just, and to I was super surprised solid when I, I, yeah. And I, I was surprised to see, I was at my friend's surprise party yesterday. All of a sudden our phones go off. We're like, holy crap. The Nets traded with the, the Dallas Mavericks. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, so I, it, this is going to be, you know, an interesting trade deadline. And what is it? Thursday. It's coming up. Um, uh, so yeah, what is the tr- NBA trade? I think it's Thursday. The rumors are going to be flying until the end. That's for sure. It is February 9th. What is that? It's in a few days. So that is Thursday. Yeah. Thursday at uh, 2 PM our time. So yeah, we've, we've really are coming, coming on this because we're recording this Monday night. So uh, a couple more days and, We'll see what direction the uh, the Bulls are are planning to go on. Yep, I've I've just my emotional investment has just dropped like a rock. But they make some surprising moves at the deadline. You know, maybe they they sell a few things, they do a few things, and then you know you get a chance to. Get some of your younger guys some playing time, you know, maybe they'll be a bit more intriguing if you know you have nothing to play for. I just, I don't want to be spending the next years just being stuck in mediocrity again. And unfortunately, it kind of feels like that's where we're heading for. Yeah, that's my goal of just blowing it up is, you know what, start fresh and, and build this right because I don't know how you do a quick fix and I don't think standing pat is the right move. Um, because you're not going to re-sign all these guys. Vooch is going to want a big contract. Do you do you want to pay him? Does he fit in your system well enough to pay him a shit ton of money? No. Um, not saying he's a bad guy. Not saying he's a bad basketball player. It's just the fit here is not working. Um, and at some point you're just gonna, uh, you know. You're just going to either fizzle out or you got to blow it up and might as well blow it up while you've got guys with value. Caruso's got value. Yeah. Drummond, Drummond's going to have value. Rosen's going to have value. Vooch has got value. Like, you know what? Just go for it then. And then, and then if you blow it up, you've got, you suddenly start getting the opportunity to, uh, keep that f- number one pick or your first round pick again, because it's f- top four protected, and mm. and you know from being out of the. Let's see where are the Bulls at? They are They're... like ten games out of being in that top four spot. Uh, yeah, for, I, just, in... I don't want to be a playing or a seven seat. Just. Uh... You know, so I mean, don't you agree with me? We don't want that. No. All right, here we go. Tankathon. Tankathon is the best. Two days, seventeen hours, seventeen minutes, and thirty seconds from the trade deadline. There you go. Oh, my watch is my watch is talking to me. Did you try to find the trade deadline for the (laughs) NBA? (laughs) Shut up, watch. Meet, meet, meet. Uh, all right. Should we wrap this up talking a tiny bit of baseball here? Sure. Um, pitchers and catchers reporting in like nine next sometime next week. So we are getting really close. Uh, and I figured we could talk about our biggest questions we have for both teams as we are a week away from pitchers and catchers reporting. Okay. Um, what is, what are your big questions for the Cubs? 
So do you want to talk more like in general players, a little bit of both, just anything, a- anything, you know, as, as we go in, you know, what are, what are your questions for, you know, the start of the season or just the season as a whole, the players involved. I've got, I've got a few of, you know, player wise and team wise. Okay. So I guess my first question is, are we going to have enough power to be legitimately competitive this year? Because yeah, you have a few guys that can hit some home runs and, you know, maybe you spread the wealth a little bit, but you're, you're probably not going to have a guy hit over 25 this year. I mean, your home run leader contenders are Saya Suzuki, Ian Happ, Dansby Swanson. Really can't put a number on Matt Mervis. We don't know what kind of playing time he's going to get yet. Uh, you could put Trey Mancini in there. I don't think you put Patrick Wisdom because I think he's not going to be an everyday player at this point. And then maybe Cody Bellinger. But of all those guys, I think the projected right now from Zips or Steamer or Fangraphs, I can't remember which one, they said the projected home run leader with like 25 was going to be Saya Suzuki. So that's the, you know, uh, mine, my first one I have, and this is not in an order, just what I wrote down first. Mm-hmm. Who's going to hit lead off for this team? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, say a Suzuki, maybe Nico Horner. I don't really, I mean, Suzuki could get on base, but don't you want him slugging a bit more? Wouldn't you rather have him down a bit? I mean, you know, that's, uh, I, I mean, that's, a. Uh, you, you know, you think about at one point they put Rizzo as your leadoff hitter. <laughs> He's a that 30 was desperate times guy. call from desperate measures. Uh, true. Yes. Um, I mean, here's like Nico Horner can hit for average and can steal bases. That's all good, but he's not a big walk machine either. Yeah. I mean, Ian Happ is a possibility, but he's another guy that can hit a decent number of home runs. Though I will say this about Ian Happ. I think if he keeps adjusting his game where it's sacrificing a little power for being like a doubles and walk machine, I think that could work pretty decently in that spot where you kind of have more of a season he had last year. Like, hey, you might not hit 20 plus homers, but you're going to be among the league leaders in doubles and you're going to have a really good OBP and a solid average. I could see that working for leadoff. Um, you know, whatever it is, it's not going to, there's not going to be a traditional guy. It's not you go, we go Dexter Fowler, unless he wants to come out of the marquee booth and bat lead up for yeah. us again. Yeah. Dexter Fowler, who did retire. Yes. Who I thought retired before. <laughs> and now he's on marquee. Yeah. Um, what's, what's your next question here? do we have enough bat missing in our pitching staff? Because I feel like our pitching staff as a whole is going to be solid, but you need to miss bats and you need to rack up some strikeout numbers. And we don't have that fireballing ace on the staff. I think Justin Steele can rack up a solid number of strikeouts. Hayden Wesneski showed some brief promising stuff with that slider he has, but like you look at Marcus Stroman He can miss, he's not an elite strikeout guy. He can miss some bats, but he's, he's not an elite strikeout. He's not a 10.0 plus K per nine type pitcher. Obviously Kyle Hendricks is not that guy. Uh, Jamison Tyone isn't really the massive strikeout guy either. So are you going to have enough bat missing? And even look at the bullpen too. You you got, I, the, the Cubs always figure their bullpen out, but you know, you don't have that. Like, I guess you could say a Roldis Chapman type guy that throws triple digits and strike guys out because you, there's more and more of that in baseball, and it's becoming more and more important to have velocity. Velocity just miss bats. I mean, I think, I think the Cubs recognize that they're not going to have big bat missing ability, and part of that is they. They try to have good defense up the middle. Agreed. Yes. Yes. And that's going to, is it going to mitigate it? No. Is it going to 
make it less noticeable? Yes. So if you get guys that are, you know, you hit it ground balls, I think it's the Cubs are going to save themselves by having good, good fielding. Um, and so I, I think it's not going to be as pronounced of an issue as maybe we worry about. And it's also going to, you know, depend on where this goes, because I think that importance is magnified by 20 when you get into the postseason. Right. But we one step at a time here. <laughs> baby, baby steps here. Yeah. Um, my next one is who's the everyday third baseman. I don't think you really have one. I think you're going to see Christopher Morrell. I think you might see some Patrick wisdom in there. They I mean, keep trying to make magical. They have him taking reps at third, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just, I think that's for trade value. Yeah, uh, probably. Um, it probably is, you know, or, or making him, seeing if he has any value at uh you know as a utility man because he doesn't have a he doesn't have a spot as a starter but if he can play third short and second you okay you're like okay maybe he fits on this team as a utility guy or he has more value in a trade if he was versatile he could be our Tommy Lastella that's what's frustrating yes and I, I think maybe that's what they're trying to see is can he do that? Um, but, you know, every third baseman they have has some sort of baggage. Is uh, I think Patrick Wisdom is the best fielder of them, but he had a lot of errors last year. Yeah, I mean, he fielded very well in 21, but 22, the, the defensive numbers dropped quite a bit. He, he's by far and away the best power numbers. Yes. But he, his batting average and on base aren't so great. Yeah, I mean, he either hits it 500 miles or his bat turns into Swiss cheese. Right. Zach McKinstry is the best fielder of everybody. But he is he is abysmal at the plate. Right. He'll, you know, I could totally see Zach McKinstry being that guy who just absolutely rakes in spring training. Couldn't oh, you know. see that? That's ab- that's a Cubs thing. Is somebody's going to rake and you're like, oh man, if this guy can do this in the season and then he goes on like an 0 for 47 streak to start the season. You know what else? I could kind of see Cody Bellinger having a really big spring. Um, Couldn't you? I could, absolutely. But McKinstry is a guy that just can't hit worth anything. But he's the he's a decent fielder. He's a decent fielder i will add excuse me you know i don't know how much you take this you might not take it at all i I will say that the past like his the final few weeks of the season he did hit pretty well but i don't know if he could read much into it so i'm not reading in it into that at all and christopher morrell is uh he's young he's he's a decent fielder um He's a decent hitter. Uh, I think I'm, I'm guessing that their hope is that he develops into the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got the most upside. Yes. Uh, because Patrick wisdom is who he is. Yes. Yeah. The, um, I, there's, there's nothing. There's going to be no new revelation with Patrick wisdom. No. And if, and nothing else, it would be really nice to have, his pop coming off of the bench in a pinch right. hitting spot. Yes. Because bringing up a guy that bats 227 as you know, with, with four home runs is not the pinch hitter you want. But if you have a guy that can just, he's, he's got so much power. He can put it out on, you know, at any spot in the outfield, put it out of the park. Um, You know, that's, that's a nice weapon to have on the bench. If Morrell can snag that job and just hold on to it. Yeah. Um, do you have another question that you have? I guess the last question I have with this team is 
can they really compete this year? Like, I think they have a high floor, but what's the ceiling like? And I think that they've assembled a, a solid fundamental baseball team that is going to play hard. That's going to be structurally sound. The thing is, is you look at the better teams in the national league, they have what the Cubs don't have. And those are legitimate stars. The Cubs have some nice pieces, but they don't have the gems. Right. Look at the Mets lineup. Look at the Dodgers lineup. Look at the Padres lineup. Look at the Phillies lineup. Look at the Braves lineup. (laughs) On paper, the Cubs don't even compare. Now, you know, the thing is, is if they play good fundamental baseball and you get hot at the right time, baseball's weird, but we've seen plenty of times where Oakland A's teams have Mm -hmm. good regular seasons because they're built a certain way, but you need stars to win in October. Yeah, you just o- do. O- Oakland and Tampa are the two, the two, you know, prototypes of you don't need to have the superstars. And but again, when was the last time, you know, Oakland won a World Series? I think I think the the better way to put it is you don't need the superstars for regular season success. Right. They are essential in the postseason. You like th- those Oakland A's rosters. You weren't winning with those. You weren't beating the Yankees with those rosters. You look at the Tampa Bay Rays. You weren't, you know, you made it to the World Series one year. The Dodgers beat you. And you made the world, you know, the, the postseason plenty of times over the past few years. You had really good regular seasons, but you think that the Rays are ever going to beat the Astros? The Astros would have creamed them. Mm-hmm. And I think that the Cubs can build towards that superstar power one day. I'm just saying we're not seeing that this year. I think this year you could see a high floor, low ceiling, competitive team that can be somewhat entertaining, but I'm not p- placing any bets for any pennants. Right. Um, let's see. You already touched on two of my points about the starting rotation and and Nick Madrigal. Where does he fit in? Um, my last question I have is, who's the closer on this team? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's going to be something by committee right now. I think you have prime candidates. They brought in Brad Boxberger. He's close before. He's kind of like, okay. You're the guy that we know you've done it before. You're coming off a good season, Milwaukee. That would be an obvious choice. I think maybe even Keegan Thompson gets some consideration. You know, it's funny because the bullpen, I haven't thought about much because I just kind of expect them to figure it out because they always do. I do hope that they can bring in one more arm. Like if they were able to bring back Andrew Chafin back, that Andrew nice. Chafin, I'm shocked that he has not, um, you know, signed anywhere. I think teams don't want to pay him much, and maybe he wants a little more than what teams are asking to pay him. That's my only thought. Or maybe he wants, uh, you know, a certain number of years. Yeah, yeah, he might want like a two or three year deal. And teams only want to give him one. Um, like I'm just I'm looking here. Who are some of the best free agents? It, um, did Michael Waka sign anywhere yet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, that's jer- that's a move I think the Sox would more likely to do. I don't think they're gonna pony up unless they're really gonna, uh, you know cut the uh the spouse abuser which is which is sad but they because they really should it would make sense for the Sox to get a guy like him but if they're not going to do it because they're quote restricted that's it's really sad jerks and profile i don't think is signed anywhere the jerk store <laughs> the jerk store elvis andrus i think is available zach Granke signed with the uh royals the royals which Probably is nice one more move. year and yeah um you know Goes in the Hall of Fame with the the Royals, hopefully. 
Um, is Andrew McCutcheon signed anywhere? Yeah, he went back to the Pirates. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. Um, is Josh Harrison signed? Yeah, he went to the Phillies. Um, I think Gary Sanchez is still available. Yeah, he is. Um, Tommy Pham signed somewhere, didn't he? Mets. Okay. Um, and then uh, Andrew Chafin. So, yeah, I mean, there's still some decent names out there. I think Andrew Chafin, probably one of the better ones. Yeah. Um, you know, we know him. We like him. Bring him back. <laughs> um, but and then one more thing I wanted to bring about the Cubs is they they made their non non roster invites for mm-hmm. spring training and Brendan Davis is not on the list. No, he's not. I wonder if they're just trying to take it easy with him. I know. I think that they were saying that he looks good physically, but maybe they're just trying to, I don't know, chill with him. I, I, I don't know. Um, You know, not a ton of surprising names. Uh, PCA is going to get an opportunity. Yep. Uh, Mervis, who I think a lot of fans are expecting to make the roster. Hoping. I my prediction is is that he starts the year in AAA and then makes it to it eventually. Rob, I mean, you know, you've got two guys that that theoretically could take that spot. You got yeah, you got Hosmer and Mancini, and I think Hosmer is going to be that guy that's just going to be around for a little bit, and then you're like, okay, if you're not doing well, we'll bring up Mervis, or if Mervis is mashing, we'll bring him up and figure him out from there. But I think they signed both Hosmer and Mancini with the anticipation of knowing that the status of Matt Mervis might not be fully determined until after spring. Well, I mean, uh, Hosmer's contract is like veteran minimum. Right. Yeah. So like they're like, okay, he's, he's your guy for now, but if you're ready to bring in Mervis and Hosmer isn't giving you much, that's an easy cut. You bring, you bring Mervis up. He's Hosmer is really just a safety net. Right. Um, you Bodie, Bodie's getting the invite and Sergio Alcantara. Yeah. I mean, I feel for Bodie, but I think his days as a cover pretty much, I think they're really numbered at this point. It's nice to have him though, because God forbid somebody gets hurt in the middle of the infield. You you know that you'll have at least someone down there that you can bring up. Right. I, I always root for him and As I don't do think I. He's, I don't think he's not talented It's just the consistency is poor. Yeah. The consistency isn't there. And I think the injuries in recent mm-hmm. years haven't done him any favors. I think the injuries have been a big part of the inconsistencies. Yeah. Um, but he's I had a very weird career. Uh, but let's wrap this up with a couple White Sox questions. Okay. My first one is, are they done making moves? Yeah. And I mean, at this point is how many more impactful moves are out there? I mean, we mentioned Michael Waka. I think that would be a solid move for them, you know, considering what's left or Elvis Andrus. They picked up Elvis <laughs> Andrus. Yeah. He, you know, he I'm surprised he hasn't gone anywhere. Though I wonder if people are worried. They're like, you know, you look at his overall stats the past two years outside of a few weeks or a month or whatever it was with the White Sox. And I don't know if that's, but I'm still kind of surprised no one at least gave him a minor league deal by now. Yeah. I mean, he's probably holding out for a major league one. Mm-hmm. But I just, it makes a lot of sense to bring him back. Is even if your plan is is to go with a rookie at second base is how, how many games is, are you going to miss from Tim Anderson at short? Because when has he ever played a whole season healthy? And what if, what if you need to spell a rookie or what if he hits a rookie wall is having a guy that can come in and play top, caliber defense and and a veteran bat i it just right. it makes a lot of sense 
but I think they might be done. Maybe they make a small trade or something or sign. I've made I, a few minor league deal trades, but that's about it. I, I, I just think it's silly if they are done. I think so too. Um, what questions do you have? Is Luis Robert and Aloy Jimenez going to be healthy? Because I think if they are, they make the playoffs. If not, they might struggle again to make the playoffs. I have health. How healthy is this team going to be? Not specifically those two, but encompassed by this team as a whole. How healthy are they going to be? Because they just have had catastrophic injuries and not injury per se, but you've already lost Liam Hendricks, you know, for cancer treatments. And, uh, you know, I'll lump one of my questions in is, will we see him this year? Is he just done for the season? Yeah, we don't know. We have no idea. And it's already starting off. We haven't even pitchers and catchers haven't even reported and you've already lost, you know, your best closer uh, for a significant amount of time. Yeah. And, you know, you pray that he gets better soon, but we, you know, you also don't want him to force anything. Oh, I mean, you know, who knows? I, I, I don't know what his, you know, the, his regimen's going to be, but uh, there's a good possibility he just gets sick and weak and, you know, doesn't takes him a while to re um, regain his strength. And I certainly hope he does. And he comes back healthy. It's just, you don't know what the timeline looks like right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, we sort of lumped my other questions into that, but my other question is, Will we see any sort of bounce back from Yasmani Grandal? That was another question of mine. And I think that obviously he's got a good overall resume. The question you bring up though is, well, is he just aging? Because it's not like he's 27, 28. He's in his mid thirties, but you know, if he's working with this conditioner that he's been working with and he does put in the work can he bounce back i mean i wouldn't rule it out but we have to wait and see <laughs> i mean it's it's hard to put up numbers that bad again uh i mean i think at this point any sort of rebound at all is helpful i just i got to know what last season was I got to know if it was just a bad year or if it was just a sign that his career is coming to a to an end just when you age you age yeah I mean but it just seems like he just had a precipitous drop um which sometimes happens but yeah I mean it, it could have just been a bad season let's see he is he will be he's just turned 34 so he's not, he's old, but he's not ancient. Um, you just you just worry with catchers, all those innings caught. But the, I mean, I would say move him to another role. But then who the hell are your catchers outside of Zebby Zavala? I mean, that's another thing. Why didn't the White Sox bring in another catcher for hmm. any insurance? Especially when you know that Yasmani Grandal is not the guy you want behind the plate in a high stakes game defensively. At this point, I mean, you know, you look, uh, fan graphs is crashing on me from 21 to 22. He played roughly the same number of games, had almost identical number of plate appearances, literally between 2021 and 2022. He had 375 versus 376 plate appearances. And, um, the difference in numbers is staggering. 2021, 23 home runs. 2022, five home runs. Uh, his walk rate, 23.2 in 2021 to 12. Strikeout numbers stayed about the same. Um, Babbitt stayed the same, 246, 249. But batting average, 240 to 202, on base, 420 to 301, slugging, 520 to 269. 
um, WRC plus 158 to 68. Oof. Um, war 3.6 to minus 0.4. That's a huge drop off. That is. Um, I mean, even if you got the 2020 numbers of slash line two, you know, he was a 1.6 war. Is 230, 351, 422. That is significantly better than 2020, even if it's a still significant drop off from 2021. Um, I mean, I think if if you can get that walk rate up to 15, 16%. Uh, keep that strikeout rate around the 21, 22 mark. Um, and if you can get that on base percentage up above 350, I think, I think you can live with him. Yeah. I, I just got to see it. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's tough, man. His, let's see, what are his, uh, his, his projections? Um, all the projections, the average of the projections has him at 12 home runs. So he's, they range from like 11 to 16 home runs, which is still a big jump from last year. Um, they all give him a big, reasonable big jump in his walk rate. Uh, and the batting average, they all put him in the, the mid 220s. And the OP, or the uh, on base between 329 and 353. Um, and they all put him in like, or most of them put him in the, the mid twos in war. I think if you get that, I. That's that's got to be a win, right? Yeah, I mean it's a hell lot better than last year. Yeah, I think it's a win. Um, is this the last year of his deal? Yes, I believe so. Oh, it was a four-year deal, wasn't it? I think so. So this is year four. So I, I think I, th- you know, I think you consider that a win if you could get, if you can get, you know. 12 home runs and uh, a 330 something on base percentage in a 2.3 war from a 34 year old catcher. Yeah. I think you live with it. It's not great, but it's, it's definitely, definitely better than, um, than what you had. Um, just quickly looking at what they the projections are for Lurry Legend. Probably not very good. Uh, come on, let's see. They put him in like the two forty batting average, two ninety on base percentage, three thirty slugging. All with a zero war. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody li- for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, etc. Uh, follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky uh, or Shy Fan Pat 2 for Alex on Twitter, Alexander J Pat Creative.com for all the cool stuff that Alex does. And uh, again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We think Dick. Uh... And God, for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win!
Cubs win. Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31. The negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.